when I was a child, I noticed that people have a tendency to die. However, I wanted, I really, really wanted my parents to keep staying alive, preferably forever. So every New Year's Eve, exactly at the stroke of midnight, I made the wish to create an elixir of life that would allow my parents to stay alive forever. I didn't realize at that time that this childish wish would direct and determine my whole future life. And since my mom used to tell me, as long as our health lasts, we last. Logically, my five-year-old self came to the conclusion that the people that might help me with my goal would be the doctors. Therefore, I decided to try and become one. And the, this wish is, to stay alive forever is probably the most human and the most desirable wish. And it has been used for ages in marketing, selling us countless of useless and sometimes even harmful products. How something sold for a better health can be harmful? Well, on my way to this TED talk, I bought something I don't use in my daily life. However, it was advertised as something that would help me with my th sore throat, with my asthma, with my hay fever, in case of colds or bad breath, and it would help me to lose weight. Why not to try it out? It says right here, sore throat protection. <laughs> As if. And by the way, you're not allowed to smoke in here. <laughs> this type of advertising comes from early 20th century. However, even by 1946, it was known that there is a link between smoking and lung cancer. And this type of ads were persuading people to buy cigarettes for health benefits almost for another decade. It has changed nowadays, however, not as much as we think. In Germany, from year 2000 to year 2016, the investment into the advertising by drug producing companies have raised more than 120% from 630 million euros to 1,487 million euros accordingly. And many of you probably think right now, well, I don't use that many drugs. However, I will be talking about something all of us do on a daily basis, and I'll come to that in a moment. When I opened a pharmacology book for the first time, I remembered its first page for the rest of my life. It was a quote by Sir William Osler that said, one of the duties of the physician is to educate the masses, not to take the medicine. I thought it was quite paradoxical and strange to put it on a book about drugs. However, after many years spent studying other medical textbooks, I have come to understand there is no elixir of life. Sorry, mom and dad. And aging is an inevitable biological process, except it seems for George Clooney. <laughs> it was clear as well that unless we are unfortunate enough to have some genetic disadvantage, most of the time our health is affected by something we do for a continuous amount of time. And the results of that seem to come decades later, like smoking and lung cancer. Even if affected by those crazy ads, we smoke for a week, it won't affect our health much. However, 
if we smoke for a decade, the chances that we will get lung cancer, lung fibrosis, or heart diseases grow dramatically. And I think that this principle should apply to everything we do in our lives for a continuous amount of time, especially when it comes to life essentials, like sleeping, eating, being active, and having sex. And those are the things I will be talking about next. But before that, I'd like to emphasize a very important take-home message. There are just two simple steps towards healthy and long life. Step number one, educate yourself about your body. Stop blindly believing the marketing propaganda. And I'm not saying you should become a health snob, because trying out stuff without the scientific proof behind it can be fun sometimes. However, this first step, which I would call as well a thoughtful consumerism, becomes particularly important when combined with the second step. Implant this knowledge into your daily life. Those pills you take from day to day, those rituals and habits you do months and months, year to year, because they will have positive or negative consequences on your life and on your life's expectancy. And you know what? I thought that Sir William's Osler quote was good, but not perfect. Therefore, I'd like to paraphrase it. One of the first duties of each human is to educate themselves about their body. And the first example I'd like to start with is something I think is the most popular activity among humans, apart from breathing, sleeping. And this brings me back to the advertising of drugs. The most popular marketing fraud, lose your weight pill, equipment, foods. Is there any link between swimming, slimming pills and the sleep? Yes, very much indeed. In fact, if we would spend as much time on planning our sleep as we do on obsessing about our perfect shapes, we would get a healthier body much quicker. The lack of sleep leads towards gaining weight in three different ways. Firstly, appetite-stimulating hormone, ghrelin, increases if we haven't slept enough. So we wake up not only tired, but as well much hungrier. Secondly, the hunger-inhibiting hormone, leptin, decreases. So we not only want to eat more after a reduced sleep, but also need more food to feel satisfied. And thirdly, our body becomes less sensitive towards glucose-regulating hormone, insulin. And this leads not only towards gaining weight, but as well increases the chances of getting diabetes. And I think that a two-step scheme of living long and healthy life is very applicable here. If we knew that the lack of sleep leads to gaining weight, Step number one, educate yourself about your body. We could implant this knowledge into our daily life and have positive long-term consequences. The second step. So, if you are trying to lose weight before stuffing the jaws of slimming supplementary business, sleep on it. And while some are sleeping, some are not. Let's talk about sex. Or to be more exact, the oral contraceptives. The oral contraceptives, or the pill, is the most popular form of birth control in Europe. In Germany, it is being used by 55% of women 
aged from 20 to 49 years old, and even by shockingly 72% of women aged from 20 to 29 years old. And uh, it has been known for years now that oral contraceptives decrease, decrease the risk of several types of cancer, like ovarian cancer, colorectal cancer, lymphatic cancer, and hematopoietic, the blood cancer, which is true. So many women have been using oral contraceptives not only as a form of birth control, of birth control but as well as a cancer preventing supplement. But, yes, there is a very big, huge but, I'm so sorry to say, the studies have shown that oral contraceptives as well increase the risk of different types of cancer, like breast cancer, cervical cancer, central nervous system tumors with more than eight years of use. With more than 10 years of use, the risk of getting lung cancer increases as well. Ladies, time to draw your constant pros table. And don't get me wrong, I'm not against contraception in any way. I think each woman has a right to decide on her own what happens in her uterus. However, I'm as well for that, that women have enough sufficient information to know what happens exactly in their bodies. In 2007, the Agency for Research on Cancer has classified the contraceptive combinations of estrogen and progesterone, which are most of the oral contraceptive pills, as group number one carcinogen, as group number one carcinogen. And this is particularly important for breast cancer. Globally, number one female cancer in the world. As of March 2017, there are 3.1 million cases with history of breast cancer just in the United States. I was born in Lithuania, and that would mean 3.1 million cases of breast cancer that each citizen of my country would have it. In fact, that's even more than the entire population. Anyhow, I don't want to preach what's right or wrong, because frankly, nobody likes being told which way to do it when it comes to sex. However, I want to emphasize the importance of knowing exactly what you're doing to your body with each action in your life and the importance of long-term consequences. Americans spend $6 billion in a year on vitamin supplements. In Great Britain, 45% of the population have a regular vitamin intake. Clearly, vitamins are vital, but are the vitamin pills? Well, the, health, the physician health study number two has shown that there is zero real benefit of taking multivitamin supplements. In fact, there was no difference between the vitamin taking groups and the placebo taking groups. And this was shown by many studies, apart with the exception of vitamin D, which due to our indoor lifestyles is often deficient. Six billion dollars can be spent variously. However, if we're talking about scientifically proven benefits, why not to spend it on something like an annual gym membership? Who then should take vitamin supplements and why? Well, in general, we should take vitamin supplements when there is a micronutrition gap. For example, during an increased demand because of a pregnancy or because of a poor absorption in case of a chronic or not disease and simple physiological reasons like age 
being newly born or really old. So, if you are a healthy adult, give it a thought. Is it worth spending that much money on something that has no bigger benefits for your health than a placebo pill? Thoughtful consumerism is good, not only to your body, but also to your wallet. During the research I'm a part of, which contributes to the better understanding of congenital heart diseases, I met one of the few adult patients we have. Let's say her name is Judy. Judy has three children, a husband, and a whole household to care about. Judy loves her family, but never really liked taking medicine. However, she had to. Four different heart drugs for her whole life. And on top of that, Judy started to gain weight. It was very worrying to her doctor because her blood sugars were bordering diabetes levels, but it was still in the normal range. Until one day, they weren't. And Judy knew for years from her doctor that being active and watching her diet would make her sugars drop. And she swore to do everything in her power to make it happen. But her busy life always managed to intervene. She was hit in the stomach by the news that she has to take yet another pill for the rest of her life. She left the doctor's office silently. I saw Judy again in a half a year for one of her appointments. All of a sudden, she looked just half the size she used to be. I asked her if she was taking the prescribed medicine. She looked at me and smiled gloriously. Not a single time. I asked her how did she manage to lose weight? Well, Judy applied the two-step scheme of living long and healthy life. She said to me, I changed just one single thing in my life. I started cycling to work every single day. By doing that, Judy managed not only to change her weight, but also to change her life expectancy. Anyhow, if we knew better how our body functions, we, could not wa we wouldn't waste our time, money, and sometimes even health on things that are being sold to us by a multi-millionaire companies who are trying to sell us this dream of elixir of life. If we stop buying those magic pills, the market will be forced to stop selling them to us. Make an empire out of our body. Do not make an empire out of drug-producing companies. Believing in magic is essential for life. However, getting your facts straight is essential for a long life. Celebrate your curious yearning, contain the desire to stir, draw comfort from knowing exactly what you are doing to your body with each action in your life, hunger to implant those actions into your daily life, which would make you age gracefully. By all means, try things out, but dread to live with bad habits forever. And remember, one of the first duties of each human is to educate yourself about your body. Education is knowledge. And knowledge, as they say, is power.